Hi, I'm Lance Cottrell, Chief Scientist at Intrepid, and today I want to talk about OSINT, or Open Source Intelligence. What is it, and what are some challenges you can encounter trying to conduct it? OSINT, or Open Source Intelligence, is information that's freely and publicly available. It's not open source in the sense of open source free software, but rather information from sources that are open and publicly available. So this is one of the different kinds of intelligence to be contrasted with things like satellite image uh, intelligence or SIGINT, signals intelligence, or human, human intelligence. OSINT, for a long time, was the redheaded stepchild of the forms of intelligence. And originally, it was conducted using things like subscribing to newspapers or recording television broadcasts, really pretty quotidian activities, pretty boring things. And it was not considered of particularly high value. What's interesting is just how much information is available from open sources. And the term was coined back in the 80s when it was referring to more conventional forms of collecting information. So, newspapers, radio, TV, counting ships in and out of harbors, things like that. Business reports as well, you know, corporate filings with the SEC. All of these provide useful intelligence to governments. But with the advent of the internet, and particularly after 9-11, the use of internet-based OSINT exploded. In fact, the internet changed many of the INTs. For example, HUMINT, is often now practiced online, but we're gonna focus just on OSINT. So when we're talking about collecting OSINT online, we're talking about gathering information from public websites. So any public uh, social media website, things like YouTube, Facebook in many cases, uh, discussion boards, blogs, uh, the deep web in some cases, depending on whether you need to create an account to access it, and the dark web which is the hidden websites accessible only through Tor. Any of that information counts as OSINT. And in fact, as social media websites are becoming more locked down and you need to create some sort of an account to access them, the definition of OSINT is beginning to get a little bit slippery. And in many cases, that's still being considered part of OSINT, but there's also now social media intelligence or SOCINT to sometimes describe that specific subset of online information gathering. Now, sometimes OSINT has gotten a bad name. People consider it this scary thing, but I think it's important to understand it is merely the passive gathering of public information. So we're not talking about hacking. We're not talking about influence operations. This is simply going and observing information that corporations or individuals have provided publicly and put out on the internet for literally anyone to be able to access. So unlike many of the conventional applications of OSINT, on the internet, one of the complexities is that your targets can watch you watching them. Because on the internet, absolutely everything you do leaves some kind of footprint or mark behind. You're always showing up in the log files of the social media website or any kind of uh, web hosting provider, but often that information is even available and visible to the users. And certainly if someone's got a blog, they'll know that you were there. And this then alerts the person to the fact that they're being watched. And if they see themselves being watched, they may react in a number of different ways. One is they could block your access to their website or to their information, you know, block your account on social media. But in some cases, particularly when you're running your own website, they may intentionally provide misinformation to you. So they'll set up the website to automatically give different information depending on who's visiting it. And if they've worked out who you are through cookies, through your IP address, through any other tracking mechanism, they can then feed you misinformation. And if you're coming from your desk in a federal government organization or a security organization, any place that that person might not want to be visiting them, it's very easy to configure the website to automatically recognize those sources and provide different content and mislead you, make it look innocent or send you down some rabbit hole. Another problem we're seeing now is account removal because particularly on social media, influence operations and spam accounts have become such a huge problem, the websites are now making a very active effort to remove fake accounts. 
Well, unfortunately, a lot of OSINT needs to be conducted through fake accounts. You can't look like the federal government agent out there, and you probably don't want to be using your real name and putting your family at risk. But if you're not very careful, you then look like exactly the kind of people that these social media sites are trying to remove. And so keeping your accounts live and viable and then making sure you're still able to collect information is becoming a serious problem. The final problem that we've seen a lot with OSINT is a glut of data. The more you are able to access, the more you then need to process and think about and handle and analyze and so we've now gone from you know, dozens of newspapers to literally millions of websites producing billions of posts. The flow of data and video and content that you could potentially have to think about has gotten completely out of control. And so one of the real skills with OSINT is understanding what information you want to collect and how to restrict the information you're getting so that you don't just get you know, crushed by the load of useless data that you could potentially be gathering. So when you're going out to do OSINT collection on the internet, there's a few capabilities that you need to have in your pocket. And the first is what we call misattribution. You don't want to be going out as yourself. Like we said, that tends to put people on alert. It tends to lead to you getting blocked. So you need to have some way of hiding who you are and where you are and making sure that the self that the person can see, that your target can see or that the websites can see is one that will be consistent with the message you're trying to purvey, that looks like someone who ought to be there and won't necessarily attract attention. Again, all you want to do is passively gather information on those websites. But still, if you look like someone who doesn't belong there, they're very likely to try to boot you out. Second, you need to be thinking about security. When you're going out to these websites, particularly depending on who you're going after, maybe very dangerous websites, it's quite possible that you will contract malware or other kind of hacking attention back against your computer. So it's critical to make sure that the computer you're using to access this data, the actual OSINT collection machine, is separated from your real desktop, your records, all of your notes, uh, your internal infrastructure. They need to be robustly isolated from each other to ensure that that doesn't become a conduit for compromise into your organization. And I recommend using virtualization and in fact destroying the research environment on a regular basis to ensure that any malware that gets into that environment is absolutely wiped out. Because if you're going up against sophisticated opponents, you may be encountering malware that your anti-malware can't detect but rolling back to a known clean version of your operating system and of your computer guarantees that you remove all of that malware. For many people conducting OSINT, the chain of custody of information is critical, in particular law enforcement organizations. They need to be able to show how, where, and when data was collected. So ensure that the tools that you're using automatically capture and tag that kind of information as you're collecting, so that when that question comes up, it's beyond doubt how you got it, where you got it, and ideally it's been forensically hashed and stored in a secure write-only database so that you can say convincingly that this was not altered, this was not gathered at a different time or place than you say it was. You have strong evidence of exactly how and where that was gathered. And this is closely related to the problem of oversight. When you're having people go out on the internet and gather information, they're going to websites all over the place, it's important to make sure that they're not behaving inappropriately, that they're not crossing any lines. Right? If you're conducting OSINT, you want to make sure that your people aren't crossing the line to actually be doing uh, engagement or influence or any other kind of activity which might not be appropriate, which you might not have authorization for, or that might be illegal in some cases. So being able to monitor that activity is super important and difficult because, of course, you're acting anonymously, you're using false names, you're using separated virtualized environments. So it requires some real effort and care to make sure that you can get the oversight and auditing capabilities of people going out and doing this kind of activity without then undercutting the security, the separation, and the misattribution that you need to actually get good data. Now, mostly we've been talking about human-driven OSINT collection, so some person sitting at a desk going out and surfing the web. 
But in many cases, the amount of data that you need to sort through doesn't lend itself to human level gathering. And in that case, you need to do automated OSINT collection. You've got to have a bot that's going to go scrape down entire websites. And now you're going from visiting dozens or hundreds of pages to thousands to millions of pages. Huge amounts of data. And so the first problem you're going to run into is you thought you had too much data before. Now you're really looking at those big data problems and reducing that automatically scanning through it to pull out those nuggets of important information is going to be job number one, because it simply quickly becomes impossible to have humans sorting through and gathering it. The next problem you run into with automated collection is you don't want to be noticed doing it. And the trick there is if you're collecting, say, a million web hits over a couple of days, that's going to stand out like a sore thumb. Someone's going to see this enormous amount of traffic coming from just one or a handful of IP addresses. So you need to take that signature and suppress it. You need to be spreading that out over thousands of source IP addresses. So it just looks like a large pool of people visiting a handful of times. Now, one trick is if your web scraping actually con constitutes a large fraction of the total activity on the website, it's effectively impossible to hide because they'll notice that just on their raw statistics. They'd been going along at some modest amount of traffic and then suddenly, bam, they get hit with this enormous flood of activity, all of which, unless you're very careful, probably doesn't look like their typical user activity. So really important to make sure you understand the website you're going after and scale your activity appropriately. I've seen OSINT collections that have crashed servers. And let me tell you, they noticed that when it happened. And of course, you need to make sure that this again doesn't come back to you. So even if you have a lot of IP addresses, if they're associated with you, someone looking at their logs can see that, oh, this organization has done all this work. So once again, you need to not only have this enormous amount of different IP addresses and sources that you're coming in from, but they've got to look plausible. They've got to be assigned to many different organizations that aren't you. And ideally, if you're going up against paranoid opponents, the patterns of activity have to look plausible. Because again, there's a lot of websites nowadays that are looking to stop certain kinds of scraping activity. And you need to make sure that you don't fall into the patterns they're looking for and you're able to get in and get this information, which once again is public information. So some of the things you might be using OSINT for would be as a business competitive intelligence or pricing intelligence. You want to be able to dete detect influence operations. OSINT was used heavily to unravel the Russian meddling in our recent elections. You may want to find people who are actively trying to do uh, jihadi recruitment or radicalization. OSINT can even be useful to understand macro trends. What kind of economics are going on in different countries? How are people reacting to new kinds of products? How are people reacting to political developments? By watching the social media and gathering OSINT, you can gain a huge amount of insight into the trends and feelings that people have about these topics and get that information in effectively real time. So one of the nice things about OSINT is that it avoids many of the legal landmines of other kinds of intelligence gathering. A lot of countries object to spy planes flying into their airspace, and they really object to finding spies inside their organizations. But OSINT is only looking at the publicly available information, so it's much less likely to create incidents, to create objections, to create issues around the activity that you're engaging in. But remember, OSINT can be detected and countered. So it's important to take precautions to make sure that your collection activities stay below the radar. And they're worth doing because the amount of information out there is gigantic. And even some very sensitive information can be put together by combining many different pieces of unclassified data. And that's one of the reasons why OSINT has really turned into a juggernaut of powerful information gathering for most intelligence organizations and many businesses. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Intrepid Cast. If you've enjoyed this information, please like and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can find many other videos on YouTube or at our website at intrepidcorp.com media. You can also follow my blogging at intrepidcorp.com blog. Thanks again. Till next time, ciao.